mercy you may use even a broken vessel. So, Father, I beseech you use now this broken vessel to be an instrument of your peace and your truth. And may these words of my mouth and these meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength. Those of you who know me know that I grew up in a fairly conservative, well, okay, really conservative, really, really, really conservative church. And, and, and not only was it conservative in theology, it was also conservative in demeanor. So, so, um, so a lot of that gets into me. So I have this tendency to, I, when, when I pray publicly, I, I actually, for a long time, I had this tendency to sort of morph myself into, uh, into a Shakespearean character. And I, I sound like I'd swallow a prayer book for lunch. Um, but there's still a certain degree of politeness, there's still a certain degree of politeness to my uh, public demeanor. Not much, but a little bit left. But I guess, I guess what I really meant to pray, what I really meant to pray when I started this, this uh, homily, if I could really say it the way I wanted to, it would be something like this. Dear Lord, right, right now for the next 15 minutes or maybe an hour or so, between you and me, I really want to blow these people's minds with your texts. I really want to change these people. I really want to make sure they leave here differently than when they first arrived. I, I would much rather, I would much rather you leave here being angry. I would much rather you leave here saying, oh my gosh, what is this person talking about? That bridge is crazy. I, I'd much rather have that than have people say, oh, the very nice human and pastor, I really enjoyed that. John 12, um, verse, um, verse 20. And I just think this because it's the first thing, it's not really what we're going to talk about. If anybody's taking notes, we're still in the preambulatory material. How's that for a five dollar word? Preambulatory. There was some, some what? There were some Greeks. Greeks. There were some Greeks. And, and we haven't gotten the one, two, three, four, five words in the text. There were some Greeks. And, and it said Greeks, and that kind of reminded me I should be reading this in its original language, which was, yeah, point A Greek. So, so I go ahead and I look at it, and, and, and I realize that it goes along fine. There were some, but it doesn't say Greeks. It says there was some prosopitos. Prosopitos. What is that? Well, it's where we get our English word, or our anglicized Greek word, proselyte. You see, those individuals, they were not just any Greeks. Specifically, they were something that Jews would call proselytes by the gate. Proselytes by the gate is what they were. And what that meant is that they were individuals who either had converted to Judaism, or were about to, or in the process of converting to Judaism. I can stop right there. We can stop right there and talk about that because to convert from one way of looking at the world to another, and trust me, that was a completely different way of looking at the world, that, that could be a whole series of sermons. But I'm not bringing this up to, to talk about the process of conversion. I'm bringing this up to show you that you would never have known that. Because you read it and it just says, well, there are some Greeks. That's just one word. That's just one word in the sea of words. That's just one word in the sea of words that has been glossed over. And uh, if you can gloss over that word, you can see how its meaning has changed. Well, it's never, ever, ever my purpose to tell you what you should believe. In, in, in fact, the day I tell you, you must believe this. The day I tell you, you must believe this, I need to give this up, get myself a paper route, and we did not have this church anymore. I can't tell you what you need to believe. My hope is to open up your sacred imagination, because I believe that imagination is sacred. We hear way at the beginning of the Bible, way at the beginning of the Bible, God created us in what? God created us in? His image. Now, does that mean that we look like God, or God looks like us? Well, you know, for some of you, it might be okay if God looks like you. But I know in the morning when, when, I, when I'm looking at the nerd shaving, I'm thinking, oh man, I hope God doesn't look like me because that's going to be an awful lot to look at for all eternity. So, I, I believe that we are created in God's image in many ways, not the least of which is that out of God's imagination, 
made something. In fact, out of God's imagination, God made all there is out of nothing. Out of God's imagination, God ordered the chaos. And we have sacred imagination. And my primary purpose always is to hope and pray that I can guide you in opening up your sacred imagination. Because I can't really teach you anything. The only thing you'll ever learn, the only thing that will ever mean anything to you, is between you and God. Only the Holy Spirit, only the Holy Spirit can actually teach you. All I can do is open up your imagination. Well, that, that's a lot. I will tell you, it's taken me a long time. It's taken me a long time uh, to, to get to that point. And I guess that brings up two things. And, and, and you, you can tell, you, you can tell that they have flunked out of this class because I always heard, when you give a sermon, you're not a stand-up comedian. You're not a stand-up comedian. Don't laugh. It's a joke to laugh. You're not a stand-up comedian. Don't use public jokes. And, and, and you know, and I start fretting my Saturday night. I don't have at least a couple of good runners. So here they come. Let's just get them out of the way, okay? Let's just get the public jokes out of the way. The text begins these these proselytes, these proselytes at the gates. They they ask, we would see Jesus. And that in itself is not a joke, but it reminds me of a story. It reminds me of a story of a particular preacher. He was a young preacher. He was fresh out of college, newly minted M. Div. And uh, he's preaching. And boy, does he preach. He's, he goes home and he does, he does his homework, and he's got a, a stack of Greek lexicons on one side, a stack of, of Hebrew dictionaries on the other side. He's got all the commentaries. And he gives these incredible college lectures. These incredible, well-crafted college lectures. This goes on for a few weeks in his new congregation. Until one day, he sees pinned to his pulpit. He sees pinned to his pulpit as he gets up there to preach, right next to his glass of water. He sees written there, Sir, we would see Jesus. Well, maybe that was the same guy, maybe that was the same young preacher, who thought he was doing particularly well, he thought he was doing a real nice job, and um, he just gave him what he thought was the best sermon of his life. And he's driving home with his wife after church. He's driving, he's feeling confident, he's feeling on top of the world, and he asks, you've heard this joke, haven't you? He, he, he asks his wife a, a, a poignant question. He says to his wife, how many, how many truly great preachers do you think there are in the world? And how many really, truly great preachers do you think there are in the world? And she thinks for a moment, and she looks over to him, and she stifles a giggle. And she says to him, well, I, I'm sure I don't know, dear. I'm sure I don't know. But I guarantee you there's one less than you think there are. <laughs> okay. So, this gentleman asked, we would see Jesus. He didn't follow this along. We would see Jesus. Sir, they said we would like to see Jesus. Verse 22. Philip goes to Andrew. Philip goes to Andrew. And Andrew and Philip together, they go to Jesus. And there are some scholars who suggest there's a break in the text. Because in verse 23, they say, uh, Jesus, do these guys want to see you? And Jesus begins talking about something entirely different. So some scholars have suggested there are a few missing verses there. We never get to find out what happens to these guys. We don't know what happens to them. And, and that could be, I, I suppose it could be some missing verses, but I prefer, I prefer to believe that maybe God has given us exactly what we need to know. And the reality is the story is not about. The story is not about these gentlemen, and if you look at it, it's a kind of meta joke. The very fact that we might be concerned about what happens to them, the men who would see Jesus, and, and, and we're worried about what happened to them, but the reality, Jesus is now telling us What's about to happen to him? So there's been a debate going on. A debate going on for a couple thousand years. Literally a couple thousand years, but especially in the last 150 years. How much did Jesus understand of this? Humanly speaking, how much did Jesus know what was going to happen? And of course the debate gets into all kinds of things, like God's omniscience, the 
foreknowledge of God. And it brings up all kinds of questions. Can God be surprised? Is God surprised by our actions? Was Jesus surprised when he found his friends sleeping when he asked them to keep watch? Was Jesus surprised when Peter, bold Peter, Peter who said, let's go and die with him, ran off? Can God be surprised? I, I, I can't read God's mind, certainly. I can't read other human beings. In fact, most of the time, I don't know what is in my mind. So I'm not going to be able to give you an answer for that question. Well, I, I will tell you, I'm happy to speculate on it. Anybody who wants to speculate on that topic, just, just give me a call, write me a text message, and we'll talk all night. Um, Jesus is talking about this a lot. There are a lot of things going on here. And I want to hold that conversation, all those things that Jesus says. He says a lot of things. We're talking about brains and wheat fall on the earth. We're talking about hating your life so you can gain it. All of these very, very complicated things. And I'd just like to, just like to bypass all that for a moment. I'd like to go right to the heart of the matter. Jesus is talking about something that is about to happen. By the way, just as a little bit of background, this conversation, this conversation is taking place right after the events we'll celebrate next week. The next event, the next major event in Jesus' life is what? We are moving inexorably towards the crucifixion. I, I, I guess that's really what I want to talk to you about today. There are at least two possible ways we can look at this crucifixion. What is crucifixion? It's not a rhetorical question. What is crucifixion? How does a person die when they're crucified? I suppose a lot of things could kill someone when they're crucified, but the primary way, at least what the Romans had in mind, is that the person would hang there and it's effectively be strangled by the weight of their own body. In Jesus' case, it was particularly brutal. Often the Romans simply tied people to crosses. The scripture tells us that Jesus was nailed to a cross. So you might possibly also have exsanguinated. Death is cold. At least that kind of death is cold. I am actually speaking from personal experience. When you begin to lose a great deal of blood, there's nothing in your body to carry the heat. When you exsanguinate, you have two things come over you. Thirst and cold. So here is the Lord of life. Here is an innocent man. Here is the Son of God. And he is crucified. Now, there are two ways we can look at this crucifixion. I will share with you the way that I was taught this, and in doing so, become somewhat vulnerable. I was taught um, that um, God hates sin. God really hates sin. And, and, and so far, no one agrees with that. We can probably all agree on that. God hates sin. What sin? I want to suggest that sin is anything which makes us, you've heard me say this before, sin is anything which makes us less than God intends us to be. Anything short of what God wants us to be. Or moreover, when we do something, when we do something that causes someone else to be less than God wants them to be. Either we make ourselves less, or we make someone else less. So I was told that God hates sin. And I was told that God must punish sin. And so far, all of that makes perfect sense. And then I was told that, initially speaking, God came up with a system of sacrifice. A system of sacrifice. Well, let us say, for example, that Norman, here we go, let us say, for example, that Norman has stolen something. Like a bologna sandwich, for example. <laughs> and if that gets costly in a bologna sandwich, well, we all understand what has to happen to Norman. Because the wages of sin is... So after church, uh, before we have dinner, we're going to have a stoning party. Just go outside, find the rocks out there, big ones, small ones, just find a rock, and, and throw it in Norman. So, God, of course, 
can't kill everybody. You might want to, but you can't kill everybody. Because we also know that we've all fallen short of what? The glory of God. We've all fallen short. So that means God would have to kill everybody, right? God would have to kill everybody. And uh, God doesn't want to do that, so I was told that God instituted a system of sacrifice. So, in Norman, instead of killing you, we're going to go with some doves. And we have two pure doves. Pure white doves. Only a year old. Now, now considering everybody's holding rocks, why are you start looking in the backyard with some doves? And, and we're going to sacrifice those doves. We're going to sacrifice those doves because the blood of those doves is going to carry on the sin. At least for a little while. And we'll do that for, you know, at least once a year, maybe more if he's really sinful. We keep still eating long sandwiches. Maybe we'll move up to something, we'll graduate, we'll upgrade. Maybe we'll kill a heifer or something. No, that won't work. It's gotta be a boy. No, it does. It does. So, and this is what I was taught. And then my, my Sunday school teachers go on to teach me that after a while, God got tired of this. After a while, God got, God got tired of this blood covered altar. God got tired of all these dying animals. And my childish mind is like, well, maybe God went vegan or something. So God said, let's just get this over with once and for all. God said, um, I am really, 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 I can't say that word. I'm really angry. I'm really angry. And I've got to hit something. i got to hit something. Anybody, ever, anybody watch Happy Days? Remember Happy Days? You guys all remember Happy Days? Just a second. Uh, and uh, remember the Fonz? Remember the Fonz? There's a scene. There's a scene where um, the Fonz, he was kind of a, he's really a good guy. He's kind of rough and tumble. He's, he used to be a, be a gang member and he kind of reformed or whatever and kind of trying to be a do-gooder now. And he gets really angry. And of course he's staying with the Cunninghams. He lives upstairs in her attic. He's staying with the Cunninghams. He gets really angry. And, and he's just so angry. He has to hit and he, goes, and he goes to hit Richie. He goes to hit Richie. And, 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 and Richie's mom, Mrs. C, steps in. And he's like, you can't, you can't hit my son. He's like, alright, fine, I'm going to hit you.
Imagine if it is we who crucified Jesus. Not God. Just imagine. Now you can say to yourself, well, well, no, no, Pastor. I understand what you're saying, I think. But, but I'm not like those people. I'm not a Roman centurion with a spear and a shield. And, or I'm not like one of those grubby disciples who ran away. You know, if I were alive then, I'd follow Jesus. Well, if I had an opportunity to meet Jesus, oh, I would love that. I would follow him anywhere. And maybe. But I'd like to suggest that every one of us in this room We've all tasted hatred. We all have our prejudices. We all know someone or know of someone that we would rather not be on this planet. What if Jesus walks knowingly into crucifixion? What if he wasn't blindsided by it? What if Jesus, the Holy Son of God, the innocent one, walks into crucifixion? What if, as he says, now is the hour of my glorification. Now is the hour I will be lifted up. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show all of you what you are. Jesus says in this text, now. Make no mistake about it. Now the world is judged. No, not some thousand years from now. Now, not when some prophet says it's going to be. Now. Now. As I'm about to give up my life. Now is the world judged. Now. Now I'm glorified. What if? What if it's not about God needing more blood? What if? How God explained to us, this is how bad you can get. This is how bad you can be. And just as Jesus, before he was killed, before he was hanged, before he walked into his own death, he preached peace. He preached love. He preached reconciliation. And while he hung on the cross, while he bled to death, while the cold and the dark and the thirst overtook him, he said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Forgive them. And praise be to God. He is the firstborn from the dead. Praise be to God. He didn't stay dead. Praise be to God. He rose from the dead. Or at least that's what I believe. And the first thing he says, the very first thing that Jesus says when he meets another human being is, oh boy, you guys are in big, big trouble. No. No, he doesn't say that at all. In life and in dying, Jesus says, peace, peace be with you. There is no fear, no need to fear. I have conquered death. I do not condemn you. Just as the woman caught in the act of adultery, just as the woman at the well, just as Peter, just as Thomas, I do not condemn you. I
this piece of 